Well, welcome everyone to this uh, Friday session, Kingdom Finance Friday Seminars. Excited to be with you today. Very pleased to have uh, have you with with us and listening in for those that uh, listen in after. You know, I was praying about. Oh, first we got to cover what we always do. I promised, I promised God I would always give Him honor. And the first thing we do is we have to say, why are we doing what we're doing? There's no point in having these sessions. There's no point in having time together and, and calling it kingdom if it isn't kingdom. And we don't want to have kingdom light. We don't want to have some kind of woke perversion of kingdom. We want people to know that we're talking about kingdom. Kingdom as a king, we're in an army. And our purpose, and I think the purpose of kingdom finance is to partner with Jesus in his mission to destroy the works of the devil from 1 John 3, 8. And that is what we're about, partnering with Jesus in his mission, not our mission. We make our mission his mission, or should I say maybe more clearly, he delegates to us works to walk in. And that's what we're about. Jesus, John 14 to 16, very clearly only did what he saw the Father do only said what he heard the Father say. That's how we're to live. That's our purpose in life. That's what we're about. It's not about finding our own way. It's not about leaving a legacy, as much as a legacy is. The church has gone into all of this euphemistic language about doing good things and denying the power of Jesus. Jesus, 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 right? Jesus. If you don't hear Jesus, from the lips of people that you're interacting with, then it's not kingdom. It may be okay. It may be nice. You may have a good time. It may be people of goodwill, but don't mistake it for kingdom. And that's the centrality of everything right there. The centrality of everything that we're talking about. Well, I was wondering what to talk about today because there's been so many things that have been swirling around in the background. And um, I had a number of things that I was interested in sharing about, a number of things happening. The, the, the world has been moving on at an accelerated pace. Could have done another long session on where things are really at economically and what, what things to look for. But I was in the kitchen this morning, and God spoke to me very clearly about Zephaniah. And um, I had to go and remind myself if it was actually a book in the Bible. And I, I knew that, but it was uh, it was definitely one of those things that you said, okay, I do have I do have it marked. I've read it in the past, but it wasn't something that was on my agenda. But before I get into what I think God was sharing about Zephaniah, What's our landscape again? I, I, I wanted to hit a couple of points about why this is important, because what I'm going to be do, talking about is light prophets, light prophets. And I would con contrast this with prophets of light versus light prophets, and you'll see where I'm going with this. But I really believe that we're in a time and a season that we, we need to be connected to what we would call in our current culture the prophetic, the prophetic. There's prophetic hubs, there's prophetic gatherings, there's people that are getting together. We need to be connected with that. Now, some call that the fivefold expression, all this kind of stuff. I'm not overly religious in the approach that we take, but there's something that has to be there that is connected to that living word, right? Moses went up the mountain, right? Presenced himself with God got a word, got, got a writing from God. He got a fresh word, and he came down to the people. There has to be this connecting, not, not fresh new words that contradict the word, and that's not what I'm talking about. But we need fresh words of where we're at, what direction is going, what do we do here, what do we do there, kingdom, kingdom. How do we run, and particularly in business, how do we make it work? Because Christian business works relatively well works the same way as outhouse businesses all right you talk to most christian business guys and they're all about debt and loans and returns and you know many of the same principles in operation and guess what if the babylonian system fails most of those christians will fail as well uh, we pray that 
there's rescue. We pray that there's things open up. But by and large, it's the same system, just with the nice elevator music, right? They've got every Turnquist or Hillsong on the on the elevator and uh, Bible on the desk, but it's the same dominion and principalities running in behind the scenes. We need to be connected to the prophetic. That's the first thing that has come to me. There's an alignment of functions that is happening now. I, I've called it post-church. And I'm not throwing out the classic church as we know it. Uh, you know, I've always been a church goer. I love uh, going the things around the church. So I'm not throwing it out. But the church has to leave its church paradigm, its church model. That, that, that is not a shibboleth. It is not untouchable. Right, God is God is going in and He's tweaking with the model. D dare I say the model was heavily focused on individuals, ego, charisma, um, artistic acting preachers, right? Um, hooping and hollering, and you know, getting the vibrato in the right place, and whipping up sometimes, or being overly somber and respectful always talking about the fear of God and their ties and everything else, but there's a, that kind of a acting model. Um, I think we're in a proto-kingdom stage right now. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it's not what it looked like before. Prophet Kim Clement had a great saying, I've seen the future and I look much better than I look right now. Right? I've seen the future... And church, our organizations, how we interact is much different than what we're doing right now. What it looks like, I'm not sure. And there's been a real caution in my spirit about form. Right now, it's about function. How do we host the presence of the Spirit? How do we host the anointing? Right? I've gone minimal. I've gone to an altar. How to build your life as an altar of Elijah. I've gone to the altar. I've gone to the throne room. I've gone to the altar. Maybe go to Moses on the mountain as a picture. That's where I'm at in my thinking. And when you try and put form on it, you can just see where people are coming from. The old pastoral types, they go and try and build a, a, a denominational model. All right? The, the YWAMer types, they try and build a subscription service where you get people in and you, you, you make, they're all money-making models. How do we make a living out of the various models of what we're talking about doing? And, and make no mistake, at the bottom of many of those systems formed is how do you get the coin? How do you make the money? How do you get the turnover? You may not know it, but, you know, having been behind this, the curtain to some, some time, they, they rate some speakers based on their ability to close. Who, who gets the big offerings for the network, Christian television networks? Somebody that's a good closer, you'll pay more money to get them in because they'll bring in more coin. I, I know it slight, sounds slightly cynical, but these models are how we've operated because we've had a funding model. And I think what God is doing is saying, no, a kingdom model, a king and a priest model is going to have something different. I, I've always viewed it that when we're looking at doing projects, how do we do projects in such a way that these projects generate a long-term steady flow of revenue that funds the kingdom that we're talking about? If we have a kingdom goal, let's build an engine room with it. And that's part of the, the genesis of what I call the 7,000, what we want to see happen projects running, a, a group of people that are connected shield bearers, reverse tithing in some manner on whatever projects they're working on, and that money then going in to fund an, a flow of kingdom, some new model. It's not church. It's not church as we know it. It's not even some of the prophetic as we know it, because what we've seen in the prophetic has been, I described it uncharitably once, it's like watching cats fighting in a sack. Um, because it's all about dominance and clicks and who gets the dominion, who gets the notoriety, who gets the word, who gets the following. And the reason it's fallen into that is people have gone for a hierarchical view, and I've spoken against this. We are not to build a new prophetic denomination. 
So when somebody comes at you in the prophetic and the prophetic movement and they're talking structure, that's when you almost have to hit your knees. Be very cautious, be very slow. Seek, seek the Lord, because what we want to stay is on function, not form. Of course, without some forms, things can dissipate into craziness and people can run away with all the money and all this. You can have all kinds of bad governance happen. So we're not talking about the, the complete lack of those things. But what we're talking about is really hearing what God is doing and not falling into doing the same things that we've done in the past. Why? I think I said this at the start of the year, that we are in a time of winnowing, a time of weighing, the breath, the, the breeze of the Spirit, the whirlwind of God, that whirlwind of heaven is going through the midst of us, personally tearing out stuff that needs to be taken out, dealing with each of us, right? We spoke um, last night on the course on shame. I, I felt it was such a powerful anointing on that session. I'd really recommend people to go and review it. I listened to it again today, and, and I was really blessed by it. Why? Because God is going through and tidying things up. If we are a people of the altar, this is all about rebuilding the altar. Isaiah 61, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness, casting off those those garments of shame and putting on his righteousness. All of these things that we talk about become real in our life when we rebuild an altar. It's not about swanning around at the front of a gathering or being recognized as somebody in some circle. That's not at all what we're talking about. Why? We need the oil. Right? We need the oil. We need fresh oil we need to be the virgins looking at Jesus' parable that have the oil. And to me, that speaks of a righteous remnant. You know, the watchmen that I speak about, they're, they're blowing the shofar to wake up who? To wake up the people that aren't on the wall, aren't on duty. Hopefully, we're all watchmen taking our turns on the wall. Because some people have to sleep, some people have to rest, some people have to be at different stages of life. I don't think that's the reality. I think the reality is much of the church is sleeping and slumbering, have no idea what we're talking about when we get into the nitty-gritty of the fourth turning, the build back better, the great reset. They don't have any, they don't have any framework for any of these things that we've been talking about for years now. They don't have a concept for it. As a matter of fact, I've been told in, in, where I've gone to speak in places, listen, William, we're not really going to get into this financy stuff because our people don't have a ma matrix for it. They're fresh out of the crib. They're still sucking the soother. We're just trying to make sure they're all awake. All right? We have to have that shift. All right? The 7,000 is a people that have to be awake aligned in armor, realizing they're in the middle of a battle, realizing that, that this is a visceral struggle against principalities and powers. And people are taking hits. We've had miracle after miracle after miracle, but the enemy's at work. We need prayer to be at work. We need to have intercession at work. We need to have this stuff going. Why? Because we're in a battle. We're in a battle. I don't have time for people that can't get what I'm talking about. I, I listened to one, one person said it best. If you don't understand what we're talking about, study harder. Listen more. Press in more. Get more teachings. Learn more. Find out what we're at. Find out about the times and seasons. Because we need to have people that when we shout, there's the enemy, let's attack. I think right now half the people would be stabbing one another in the back. Remember cats fighting in the side? Half of the people would be stabbing one another in the back. We need to know exactly where we're going, what our purpose is, because we're in warfare. So I think we're right now at least, we're talking about a remnant. Major shifts happen through Nazarite warriors. All through the Bible, the, the leaders, the precursors for change, 
were these Nazarite called apart, set apart watchmen, those ones, the John the Baptist in the spirit and power of Elijah cultural architects, because those are the people that shift the culture of nations, but certainly shift the culture of the people of God. Um, not everybody is called to be a good Christian by eating locusts and wild honey and wearing a hair shirt in the wilderness, but John the Baptist was. Not everybody's called to let their hair grow long and never touch alcohol, but Samson was. Right? There's callings and unique and strange fasts that are called upon Nazarites. Many of the people that I talked to in the 7,000, God's spoken to them to do this or fast that or do this or do some prophetic acts that sound weird. Why? Because that's how God moves in people that he's calling to be Nazarite warriors. The remnant that brings about change. I that's what the 7,000 is. By all means, people can tag along and learn something. We, we're, we're broad church. People are welcome. But we are 7,000 Nazarite warriors. That's it. 7,000 Nazarite warriors. Reverse tithers, people that want to give radically, people that want to see radical stuff happen in their land, that want to, that want to be Isaiah 61 turned on its head, right? Cultural architects. We want to do something that impacts and changes. That's the remnant. That's what I talk about when I mean the remnant. I'm talking about that righteous remnant. So where does the idea of light prophets come? Uh, and I'm going to start here. Ze Zephaniah 3, 4. It starts actually 3, 2. It talks about people that didn't listen to and heed the voice of God talking about a nation or a land or a city. She accepted no correction or instruction. She trusted not in the Lord, but was confident in her own wealth. She drew not near to God, but to the God of Baal and Moloch. So it's talking about not seeking God as your vital and urgent necessity. That's what I talk about, being up the mountain like Moses, seeking God as your vital and urgent necessity. Right, like I did today for people, what do you want to share today? I want to talk to people about Zephaniah. Why? Because it's going to have a weight of kingdom glory on it than if I just grabbed a sermon from you or, or talk from some time back would be interesting, but wouldn't carry that weight of timeliness. And sometimes you don't hear until after when you hear talk to people how relevant what you're speaking about was for one or two people in particular. Verse 4, her prophets are light. That really struck me. Her prophets are light. Not prophets of light. Maybe here all through the Bible, we have to be prophets of the light. Her prophets are light. The Amplified describes it as lacking truth, gravity, and steadiness. No gravity. No weight. Lacking truth. And men of treachery, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a dangerous thing about light prophet. Her priests have profaned the sanctuary, and how? Defrauding God, God and man by pretending their own word is God's word. They have done violence to the law or the word. Pretending their own word is God's word. We see that sometimes, you know, where there's a, a move, you have a word, you give your word. Once in a while, that sparks another word on the same topic. But then there may be somebody that says, I'm not going to be out, Sean. And they come in with something. All, all that that does is, is detract from the word that you've given. Because now you've got a, a plethora of words. And you can see who the best actor was. Light. Tinkling. I'm not going to be outshone, so I'm going to come up with some, I'm going to magic something up and come up with something. And sometimes that can be okay, but sometimes it can be very well off. Remember, prophesying, if you're in that spirit of prophecy that's in a room, you know, Saul met the prophets and prophesied. Nobody would say his heart was right. Saul sent out his hitmen to get David for execution. 
um, they met the prophets and prophesied. So simply being able to come up and say something is not what we're talking about. We're talking about have you got something from the mountain of the Lord that you're carrying back tablets for? I don't want to make it too weighty because the, the, the prophetic inspiration can sometimes be very light. Sometimes the lighter impressions that I've had have had the most powerful impact. I'll give you one example. I had a word for somebody in a local church. Had the guy's name. I said, the, this is the name. And I'm seeing a house. Uh, I had part of the number. I said, this is the number. And I see the door turning light and dark, white and black, white and black, white and black. And you're about eight years old. And that house was not safe. You didn't know walking in that door, whether you're going to meet Jesus or meet Satan. Words to that effect. Well, I, I didn't know the story. Small church, all the people with that name were looking at one another uh, to see what it was about. It turned out there was a guy visiting from a different country. And uh, it turns out about that time he'd been sexually abused in, in, in that house by his father. And he wanted to know after how, who had told me how, how I knew. Right? Light and dark, light and dark. That was just a fleeting impression. It was very light. Right? But that's the weight of the Spirit. The Spirit wants to go and reveal things and, and see things opened and deal with things that need to be dealt with. So Zephaniah 1, I'm just going to give some scriptures from it as we go. Because we're talking about light prophets. And I'm going to read Zephaniah 1 and, and, and take out some highlights from it. But, but you know what hit me? I'll, I'll just hit it for you first. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah in the days of Josiah, King Judah, the son of Ammon. King, and I think if I'm correct, it doesn't matter, the inspiration still works, but I think Zephaniah is linked to my word for 2024 about King Josiah. This is the year of King Josiah. And if you go back to that, what was King Josiah about? The year of King Josiah. And I'll read you the story a little bit. I had a dream on 13th December where I heard the Lord say that 2024 is a King Josiah season. King Josiah season. So let me set the stage. I'm just going to read this a little bit. Described in 2 Kings 22 and 23, horses and chariots dedicated to the sun god lined the entrance to the temple. Everyone consulted mediums. Wizards and idols were everywhere. Inside the temple were vessels dedicated to the worship of Baal, Asherah, the hosts of the heavens. Asherah idols were in the temple along with altars for worship. Right beside the temple were the male cult prostitutes and people who served the Asherah. Nearby, the sacrifice of children to the god Moloch was still in practice. This was the norm for the day, and everyone lived in this reality. They didn't know anything else. This is the picture of daily life, and worse, when a copy of God's law and covenant was found in the temple. They found it in an old box in a corner. It seemed like everyone had forgotten how to live and had been fully absorbed by the culture of their day, just like we are many of us. Defilement had not just crept in, it had become the norm. Then someone found an old scroll and everything changed. Then Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes and the king commanded, go inquire of the Lord for me. And for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not listened and obeyed the words of this book to, to do according to all that is written concerning us. So that's the scene of Zephaniah. That's the scene. So what does Zephaniah then go on to say? And I'm going to skip a few verses, but read all of chapter 1 um, when you have a chance. I will destroy 
every remnant of Baal worship in this place. The very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, and who also swear by Molech, that's the mixed waters. Those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of them. If you're not seeking the Lord and inquiring of him, you're falling into this camp. Particularly if you want to be a person that we would call a person in the prophetic. At that time, I will search Jerusalem. I will search your city, your town with lamps and punish those who are complacent. Complacent. We can't be complacent about the battle that we're in. Who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. They're denying, and we see this all over, they're denying the fact that there is a God in heaven. Right? They might believe in a cabal or, or conspiracy amongst men, but they're denying the work of Satan. They're denying the work of God. Guess what? There is a God in the heaven. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. And I think this speaks to the time that we're entering into as well, because that, that's a time of upheaval and a time of judgment, a time when systems are changed and collapsed. Though they build houses, they will not live in them. You see, that links to the curse that we talk about in the course, right? Deuteronomy 28.30, what does it say? You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but not live in it. Build houses they will not live in. Though they plant vineyards, they will not drink the wine. That's another clear reference to you shall plant a vineyard, but not gather its grapes. That's Deuteronomy 28.30. So what we have there is the words of this scripture mirroring exactly the curse that we talk about on the course in Deuteronomy 28, the opposite of the blessing, before your blessing and cursing. The curse is this. And this curse is being poured out, and we see what it's about because people have lost their way. I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Here's the clearest reference. Sin against the Lord. Deuteronomy 28, 29 says what? And you shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness. As the blind grope in darkness. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Listen, let me tell you, the kingdom business, kingdom finance is not about silver and gold. It's about silver and gold, but it's not about silver and gold. It's about the kingdom. All right, that, that's, that's why spiritually we're told that the incorruptible gold can rust. Right, because we're talking about kingdom level realities kingdom level realities, kingdom level release, the prophetic calling and anointing that we as a, as a remnant people have to walk in. Matthew 7.15 says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The ravening hunger is the mark of a false prophet. Somebody has to be up has to be seen, has to grab the mic, has to continue on beyond where, where things are at. Ravening, ravening. I had a word about ravening hunger as a caution for the prophetic. But false prophets, and this is 2 Peter 2.1, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift, swift destruction. So we've got to be careful about destructive heresies, which is why from time to time I speak about some of the deceptions that I'm seeing rise up in the body of Christ. Deception, deception, deception. Right? 
what happened? Moses is up in the mountain getting a genuine, I'm going to call it prophetic revelation, a revelation from God. What's happening on the earth? They're getting tired of waiting and they're building a golden calf to worship. it. They're taking the provision that God gave them for the service that he's called them to, and they put it into things that are not what he'd have them put it into. I've spoken to that quite a bit. 1 John 4, 1 to 6, another scripture. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. And here's where we started with the Jesus, right? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them, right? If you're not talking about Jesus, if you are not talking about Jesus, confessing Jesus, speaking Jesus, then you're motivated by the spirit of the Antichrist. Just prove me wrong, 1 John 4, 1 to 6. We don't have any room for that. And so many people that are strong voices, maybe not prophetic voices, but they're out there speaking, they've got a platform, they're on Instagram or they're on other social media talking about kindness and gentleness and legacy and everything else. Jesus, where's Jesus? Sorry, where's Jesus? Antichrist, antichrist spirit, false prophet. Maybe some wisdom there. I think there's lots of, you know, lots of wisdom. I'm sure you can read Buddha and find some wisdom that makes sense at times. You know, it's better not to drown in the, in the lake than better to learn how to swim. I mean, there's going to be some good stuff in there. Um, but the reality is, it's not kingdom. If a prophet or priest or anyone claims this is a message from the Lord, I will punish them and their household. But you must not mention a message from the Lord again, because each one's word becomes their own message. He jumped into Jeremiah and the false prophets of Jeremiah. Message from the Lord. Lana Bowser, Donna circulated this. I, I saw it today. I'm just going to read it because I think it lines in with some of the things that I've been talking about. Watch the prophetic movement in this hour because I am about to turn it upside down. And the pure prophets, pure prophets, what I would call the prophets of light, the pure prophets shall remain. For what is happening in the prophetic movement and behind the scenes is a prostitution of my revelation and of the secrets of my heart. And it's time for a demonstration of the pure prophets and pure prophetic to be seen across the earth. Here I come to shake, rattle, and roll. Here I come to remove and tear down in an accelerated way what has been built in pride, what has been built in elitism what has been built on false foundations, deception, and to feed the flesh and appetite of man. No longer will the words of my heart be used and abused. Showmanship, excessive devotion and desire to be in the so green rooms of meetings, excessive desire to be showcased at the front of a meeting, Jealousy when somebody else has a powerful word and you don't that day. All of this kind of motivation of self driven by the shame that we talk about in the course because it's coming from a cracked and broken foundation and cracked and broken identity, right? Pirates can't give accurate prophecies. Lawlessness can't generate the, the kingdom that we need to be transformative in the world that we're operating in. We can't do it. We can't do it. Jeremiah 6 talks about this. 
Stand by the roads and look and ask for the eternal paths where the good old way is and walk in it that you will find rest. And I set watchmen over you saying, hear and obey the sound of the trumpet. But they, the people say, the rebellious people, we will not listen or obey. What comes from it? Well, we saw the curse comes from it. I am bringing evil upon this people, the fruit of their thoughts, their schemes, and devices. You know, I spoke about the winnowing wind, and it was a warning for a season. It was a warning for a time. It was a warning for people to sort out their stuff, to get things in place. I spoke about God dealing with the left-wing prophets, people that were having an excessive antichrist element in what they're talking about. I spoke about the lack and the need to not have um, hierarchy and power dynamics in the movements that we're talking about, right? And, and I, I, just, I just feel that that warning is fruit. Fruit to me, whenever we're talking about something, we have to look at our own lives and say, God, if there's any wicked way in me, Lord, please deal with it. Um, but I think broadly for what we're talking about, this is not going to be tolerated in where we're going. That This battle is an existential battle, and, and God is sharpening up, sharpening up his people. He's sharpening up the level of discernment. He's sharpening up where people need to be. There's people that are, are uh, you know, I believe even people that have got things wrong are, go are going to be in, in the season where God is dealing with them in repentance, dealing with them to call them back. What do we do? We who have maybe a little bit extra vision. Why do I say we've had extra vision? Because we've been talking about this for years now. Some people, this is maybe the first or second time they've heard something like this. We've been talking about it for a long, long time. Right, the de Jesus of ification of the church, the woke church, the things that are happening on. No, this is sobering, brothers. God is wanting to bring people into alignment. We have to seek Him first as our vital and urgent necessity. If we've got things wrong, if we built golden calves, if we have holy cows, deal with it, repent, get this stuff out of our lives. Right? If we've blown our money where we should have given it to kingdom ventures and has gone elsewhere, repent. King Amaziah, I think it was, wasn't it? That hired the 100,000 mercenaries for 10,000 or 10, 100 shekels of silver. That's the proof. Economic uh, mistakes, the prophet said to him, God is more than able to re repay that money or to, to, to cover that money, bring that money in, more than able to remedy even our financial mistakes. So what we need to do now is to say, Father, we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. We hear your voice and not the voice of another. If we've been motivated by identity, if we've been motivated by pride, if we've been motivated by trying to set up a fabricated identity, if there's been any elements of shame operating in us that have been causing us to hide our true self from you. If there's been any offense operating in us. Father, if there's any of this stuff, Father, reveal it. We, but we, we repent for that now. We seek you today as our vital and urgent necessity, knowing that we are in a war and in a battle, and we need to hear the word from our commander for today. Maybe yesterday it was safe to go left around the mountain, but today you'll get killed. We need to know today what you would have us do because you want to cause us to walk in works so that we can live the good life that you've prepared for us to walk in. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I just release the good life that you've prepared for us to walk in. I decree and declare no more hard roads. No more hard roads. I, I decree and declare that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I decree and declare that the yoke around our necks is broken because of our prosperity, because of the fatness of our neck. Like Abraham, people are going to point and say, what in the heck is going on there? How 
are they prospering in the cycle that we're talking about? Why? The yoke is broken because of the fatness of our necks. So, Father, I just release that now and by faith in the name of Jesus. I pray that you'd help us to navigate these tricky waters that we're talking about. I pray for people that we're connected with, the people we know in ministry. Father, that, that there would be a revelation of this power word and that we would see fruit, 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 fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.